there are those who run away from a gunfight. And I came off a helicopter in the middle of the night in uh, Samara, Iraq. <clears throat> we trudged some uh, eight kilometers over muddy fields uh, on our way to a target to prosecute an enemy that was uh, creating some issues out there. And uh, on the way across the field, about 400 meters away from the target, a couple cars uh, halted, men peeled out, and we started receiving fire. And you get that distinctive sound of bullets zipping over the head. And uh, what I noticed at that moment in the darkness with about 36 guys I was supporting in a ranger task force, some of the courageous men who uh, serve your nation, everybody paused and froze. 400 meters away from uh, the edge of the city, and uh, men took a knee, and we had that pause on the battlefield that I think men who've been in combat, women who've been in combat understand that tactical pause. And what I noticed at that time was um, something that came up over and over again in the back of my head is, is the kind of things that are, are a little bit ironic until you've seen them. The Army trained me, uh, FM 7-8, the manual on how to fight and how to survive near ambushes, said something a little bit awkward, which is, you know, if you're uh, ambushed by an enemy to survive it, you should run into the fight. You should run into the enemy forces and put fire on them. And so uh, all the training kicks in, like they always say, it's very cliche, but I stood up, I grabbed the interpreter, and we started moving into a firefight. And in the back of your head, you have these conversations. Is this really smart? Is this really the right thing? Or, or is one of these bullets gonna hit you? And you don't know. And so you have to kind of give it all the chance and luck and fortune and start moving into it. So once I stood up though, what I want to tell you is what happened after that was one of the greatest feelings I've ever had. And uh, it was in combat, so you're stressed out, and you feel isolated. You feel alone. You're not sure if this is the end of your road. And so when I stood up with Ronnie, the interpreter, and we started running towards the gunfire, I noticed across the field all those men who had taken a knee and were paused, just for no other reason than we were moving, stood up along with us started moving to the gunfire with us. And once you had those 36 heavily armed men, heavily laden with gear, putting fire on the enemy, we overwhelmed them. None of our guys were hurt in that mission, and we secured the target. What's important about that to me was that when you're moving to the fire, when you're moving to an issue, when you're, when you're standing by yourself, and you don't know that there are others around you, you can feel kind of isolated. You can feel like you're the only one. But when you start moving in the right direction, uh, he was Representative Abraham, said uh, Lincoln. So it's when you decide to put your feet in the right place and stand on principle. When you decide to fight and you look to your left and you look to your right, people who are sitting on the same side of the aisle, the opposite side of the aisle, representing different equities, they're all here fighting together for the same cause. And that is a miraculous thing. But it reminds me of a quote, I think uh, from uh, a Pericles, it goes back a little ways who says something really interesting. He says, you know, he can have, um, you can have all the ideas in the world. I'll paraphrase it a little. You can have all the ideas and the thoughts, but if you can't express them clearly in action, if you have no way to clearly express those thoughts, then they're as good as not having ideas at all. So having the desire to fight, having the motivation to fight, to link arms with others, that's a, that's a great thing. But having that desire is worthless if there is no tool, there is no organization, there is no way to effectively put those thoughts, those actions into the real world. That's what the Concerned Veterans for America is. 